narration and Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba from Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says radiallahu ta'ala anhu anna rahiban abadallahi fi sawma'atihi sitina sana. There was a man, a rahib, a monk, who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his temple for 60 years. فَجَاءَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ فَنَزَلَتْ إِلَىٰ جَنْبِهِ فَنَزَلَ إِلَيْهَا فَوَقَعَهَا سِتَّ لَيَالٍ So a woman came in his presence and he started to develop an attachment to this woman and he ended up uh, committing zina, ended up committing adultery with her and he stayed in that state for six nights. So the narration actually explicitly mentions that this happened for almost an entire week. Now what happened to this man as he came to that realization? And so the man, as the, as the narration continues, that after he committed that deed, he then went, ثُمَّ سَقَطَ فِي يَدِهِ فَهَرَبَ فَأَتَى مَسْجِدًا He ran away. But where did he go? Where are you going to run away from? You're going to run away from a masjid? You're going to run away from the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So where is that man going to go? Did he go home? Did he go to, to a friend's house? No, he went to another masjid. Atta masjid. Which is a very smart move. He understood, لا ملجأ ولا منجأ منك إلا إليك. You don't escape from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to start over and I need to beg Allah for forgiveness, but I need to get out of here. So he went from his own masjid, the one that he used to worship Allah in, to another masjid. And the narration continues, فَآوَى إِلَيْهِ فَمَكَ ثلاثة. لا يطعم شيئا. So he went to that masjid and he took residence in that masjid for three days and he did not eat anything for three entire days. It's not that he was starving himself. It's not that he was trying to commit suicide. It's that he was so immersed in his repentance that he was not even eating or drinking. He wasn't paying attention to his food and his drink, which is a testimony to the man's sincerity in this, in this case. He felt so bad about it, he wasn't even paying attention to his food and drink. So as the hadith continues, you think about this man sitting in the masjid now for three nights, crying over what he committed for six nights, not even thinking about the 60 years that preceded those six nights. Because right now, those six nights obscured all of those years of worship to him, begging Allah for forgiveness. So some people noticed him in the masjid. And so they brought to him a raghif. They brought to him a loaf of bread. And they told him, Ya fulan, oh so and so, you haven't eaten, go ahead and eat your bread. So the narration says that the man took that, فَكَسَرَ نِصْفَهُ He broke the bread into two pieces. فَأَعْطَى نِصْفَهُ رَجْلًا عَنْ يَمِينَ وَأَعْطَى الْآخْرَ لِرَجْلًا عَنْ الشِّمَالِ He gave one half of it to someone on his right, one half of it to someone on his left. And the man continued to immerse himself in seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that very moment, at that very moment, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Allahu ilayhi malak al ruha. Allah sent the angel of death in that moment to him and took his soul. So he died in the masjid, in a state of repentance, the place where he started. But the narration gets really, really interesting in the end. And by the way, it's a Sahih narration. Sahih al-Imam al-Albani was Shaykh Shakir. It's a very powerful narration and it's an authentic one. Listen to what he continues to say. He says, فَوُضِعَ عَمَلُ السِّتِّينَ سَنَةَ فِي كِفَّةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his 60 years of worship on one side of a scale. وَوُضِعَ السَّيِّئَةً فِي كِفَّةً And Allah put that six nights of adultery on the other side, فَرَجَحَ السَّيِّئَةَ The six nights were heavier than his 60 years of worship. لَا تُبْطِرُوا صَدَقَاتِكُمْ بِالْمَنِّ وَالْأَذَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, don't void your charity. Sometimes, charity, good deeds can be voided. So those six nights voided his 60 years. But then what happens to him? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ثُمَّ جِيءَ بِالْرَغِيفِ Allah brought forth that piece of bread and then put the bread on one side of the scale with his six nights of sin, فَرَجَحَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ And so the raghif, the bread, outweighed his six nights of adultery and entered him into Jannah. This is a really interesting narration. And there are many powerful lessons to be derived. So let's go through them for a moment. Number one, 
the ulama point out that his sin only affected himself, but his good deed affected others. His sin only affected himself, but his good deed affected others. When you commit a sin, and of course in the case of that woman who also committed a sin, when you commit a sin, how many people are you harming with that sin? And Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah says, Tulba liman mata wa matat ma'ahu thunuba. Glad tidings to the one who dies and his sins die with him. The only sins you have are sins that are between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Allah can forgive all sins. You will meet only your Lord with your sins on the day of judgment because you do not want your sins to involve other people because Allah's mercy will not stop him from being just to those who were harmed. They also deserve his mercy. They also deserve justice. So glad tidings to the one who dies and his dhunub and his sins die with him. So the first lesson we take from this is that concept. How many people are affected by my sins? That doesn't mean that we belittle any of our sins. The Prophet says, beware of belittling sin. But how many people do I hurt with my sin? The flaws that I have, the faults that I have, are they between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm actively working on them? Or are they affecting other people? And then you look at your good deeds and the best good deeds are not just the ones that affect yourself, but that affect the people around you, that benefit the people around you. So his sin only impacted himself, but his good deed was to others. His good deed was to others. We learn another thing from this that he did not wait like in the story of Barsisa, in the story of the other monk from Bani Israel, the Prophet ﷺ told us about, who fell into zina. I mean, it's fascinating. You have two monks, two narrations about monks from Bani Israel, from the same nation, that both worshipped Allah for six decades, and they both committed adultery. But one of them ended his life in prostration to the devil, with murder to add on to his adultery. The other one ended his life in prostration to Allah, and with charity that followed that adultery. Two almost identical stories up until that point. What is the difference here? The man caught himself before he was caught. The man recognized himself before he was caught by others. One of the greatest tragedies of sin is when you wait for someone else to stop you than stopping yourself. Umar bin Khattab anhu. There is a story of this man, and it's a true story, that this man came, this young man was brought to Umar anhu for stealing. And as Umar was about to punish him, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mini, it's my first time. He said to him, you're lying because Allah always shelters you the first time. Allah covers you the first time. And by the way, in the story of both of these monks, they were both covered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially, right? Even in the story of Barsisa, he just chose to make this a much worse situation to cover up his tracks. But Allah covered them. He said, Allah always covers you the first time. And so he was punished and he came to Umar radiallahu anhu crying and he said to Umar radiallahu anhu after the hadith was performed, he said, Ya Amir al you were right. This was my 21st time stealing. That was the 21st time I committed sariqah. I got away with it once. I kept on doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. When a person commits a sin, the most powerful motivating factor to quit that sin needs to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else. It needs to be that first and foremost. Not reputation, not even family. Yourself, Allah. Allah did not put me here to do this. So you catch yourself. And in the situation of this man, he did not wait to be caught, he caught himself. The third thing we learn from this, his good deed came after his sin. So the good deed that preceded his sin did not avail him of any good on the day of judgment. The good deed that comes after his sin did help him and make his case to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is in a hadith we find from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا Follow the sin with a good deed and it will wipe it out. إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتَ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ That good deeds wipe out bad deeds. So make sure you follow up your sin with a good deed. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, if you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a place do not leave that exact place until you've obeyed Allah in the same place that you disobeyed Him in. Replace it. Do something in its place. Now shaitan comes to you to make you despair when you commit a sin, and he tells you one of two things. Either 
What's the point of doing good deeds now? You should just despair for the rest of your life. You're a filthy, horrible human being. Or even worse, why don't you just keep sinning now? Or sin to cover up for your sin and keep digging yourself into this hole. You might as well. You're already deep in it. That's, that's also, that's an added element to despair, to keep getting worse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to His karam and jood, His generosity and benevolence and His mercy, even in your lowest moments. Allah Azza wa Jal does not turn away from you. Another story of a man from Bani Israel was the man who killed a hundred people, but made his way to be forgiven, wanted to change his life, started to turn towards a different direction, and Allah forgave him just for being on the way to his new destination. So Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala calls you to good after you commit your sin, no matter what, no matter how bad it was. Allah did not shut the door on anybody. Allah Azza wa does not shut the door on you. Do not let the shaitan or your lowliness or your false sense of guilt lead to despair. Do not let it betray you. Instead, see what you can do now to compensate, to expiate for that which you've committed. And finally, subhanAllah, if you look at the sin versus the hasana that he did. If there is one thing I want you to remember from this khutbah, it's that you always let the beauty of your repentance exceed the ugliness of your sin. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to falter. We're going to fall in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to do things that we may have previously thought of ourselves incapable of doing. But let the beauty of your tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just wipe out in the mizan, not just wipe it out in the scale of good versus bad. But let it wipe out its effects. Let it be a beautiful repentance. When you look at the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, you don't even consider their past lives because of the beauty of their obedience and service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't even bother you. You don't think about it because of that which they have done of good after their sins. When you think of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, you're instilled with pride for the great that he did. Let the beauty of your repentance exceed the ugliness of your sin. We also see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of mercy to this person saw sincerity in him. And Allah set him up in a situation where he could do some good. He didn't go out and look for sadaqah. He didn't go out and look for charity. But Allah pushed that charity towards him due to the goodness that Allah saw inside of him. Allah knew that this was a good man. That this was a man who messed up and who caught himself and who was now immersed in repentance and remorse but was so immersed in his remorse, he didn't even know what to do with himself at that point. So Allah Azza wa Jal sent this goodness to him to open that door up for him. You know, subhanAllah, you find some people that are given husn al-khitam, that are given a good ending. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, when Allah loves a person, He guides him right before his death. <laughs> right before his death and overlooks his entire life of dis disobedience. Some people of goodness, they have good, but they don't have hidayah yet. They don't have guidance yet. There's something missing. The, the, the essential ingredient is missing. And Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, implants it in those last moments of their life in order to do away with everything that preceded it. When Allah looks at you and you need to ask yourself, do I deserve husn al-khitam? Do I deserve a good ending with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do I deserve to have Allah Azza wa Jal push me to that khair in those last moments of my life? Push me to that goodness in those last moments of my life? Because Allah knows what's in here. And Allah knows what I desire. And Allah knows what I want. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not set up a righteous servant who is truly righteous and sincere for failure. Allah azza wa jal pushed that good towards this man. Lastly, was the 60 years that came before useless. And this is probably the most troublesome part of this hadith. How do you d deal with the 60 years of worship? Meaning, is he in the same category as someone who would have disobeyed Allah for 60 years and then just after committing zina for the last time in those 60 years went to the masjid and gave that raghif and gave that bread in charity is he in the same standing as him and the ulama point out something very important here the answer is no because it's because of those 60 years of worship that the man moved to repentance in the first place the ma'rifa the knowledge of Allah was already inside of him and it was obscured by a temporary lapse. But at the end of the day, those roots were still there and they came to fruition in those last moments of his life. 
And this is a lesson for parents. May Allah protect our children. Everyone say, I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them. But when you put in your children roots, good roots, and then they start to slip and you say, Ya Allah, what did I, where did I go wrong here? Bidnillahi ta'ala, the good roots that you put there, they'll come back. They'll come back. It'll reel them back in bidnillahi ta'ala. Because those good roots, they do something to the engineering of the nafs and the heart that put in that ma'rifah of Allah, that instill hopefully a knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will catch them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have our best of deeds be the last of them. May Allah azawajal give us husn al-khitam, a good ending, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow us to fall victim to the despair of the shaytan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all of our shortcomings and sins, the private ones and the public ones, the major ones and the minor ones. Allahumma ameen. Alhamdulillah, we are happy to announce the launch of the One Islam TV app. Watch hundreds of high-quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran learning videos, stories of the prophets, and so much more. Two new videos uploaded daily, inshallah. Watch videos on demand, or download videos and watch offline. No more annoying ads or pop-ups. 100% safe browsing for your peace of mind. Watch or listen to lectures and lessons while you work, rest, or drive with your device switched off. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means the small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariya, continuous charity for you, as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders. Insha'Allah. The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. So you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work.